Hello and welcome to chapter two of Immersive Talk, the Southwest based podcast all about immersive media. My guest for this episode was Philip Kingsley, who is the co director of the theatre company Four of Swords, who do location based immersive theatre. You'll notice almost immediately that the sound quality of this podcast is a bit rubbish. I'll spare you the technical details. And all I can say is that I'd recommend you listen to the podcast anyway, because the content is still good. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So, I'll quickly introduce myself. Hello. Hello. Okay. Bill King- Kingsland? Uh, yeah, Kingsland. I've called you Bill Kington for like three years. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind. Um, you are the co-founder with Phil White? Yes, of Four of Swords, which is a, which started in 2013 with a vision, with, the, with a vision of Jekyll and Hyde uh, in the ruins of Portland House, uh, which is a collaborative amazing, basically a immersive theatre. Correct. Um, could you take a little time to talk about your original mandate with Four of Swords? Okay, sure. Um, so when we started Four of Swords, both Sarah and I were running uh, jobs which neither of us felt particularly uh, fulfilled by. And um, we both really wanted to kind of get into get into theatre. And you know, both of us met doing AMDRAM or community theatre stuff, um, stuff. But we had this feeling that there wasn't anybody in the Southwest creating, I mean, probably out of ignorance rather than the fact that there wasn't <laughs> anybody, but we had the feeling that there was nobody creating the kind of theatre that we really really wanted to see yeah. and by that we meant something uh, visceral something um multimedia something immersive mm. uh, basically so right from the start that was our mo um it was basically the, the what characterized um a sort of, sort of show coming out of jeff and hyde was basically rejecting traditional performance spaces finding uh, places instead which had historical or cultural or aesthetic value in themselves were unusual as um, performance spaces. The, I mean, pretty much all the shows that we've done have been promenade based, so there's a journey through this location, whatever it is. Um, and we wanted live music, we wanted film projection, uh, we wanted to basically collapse the boundary between theatre, cinema, live music, everyday life, mm. uh, basically, and collapse the boundary between the actors and the audience. Mm. But we didn't want, um, I, I think we both found it quite, well, not potent, <laughs> not a problem per se, like there's, there are people who do it incredibly well. But a potential problem is potentially cringy when you're when you go out of your way to kind of make a, a performance interactive in some way. Mm. So we've kind of um, skirted that. I mean, there are a couple of moments where because it feels some people make it more of a wrapper around the performance rather than making it an integral part of it. Yeah, it's got to be organic, right? It's got to mm. be part of, of the concept. And if it works, like sometimes a little opportunity will. Um, suggest itself, um, but for us, that's never been um, never been a key uh, part of of our vision. Mm. For us, it's, we didn't want to pe- put people on the spot. We didn't want to potentially make them uncomfortable. Um, although well, I suppose we've changed that, <laughs> but but we wanted to just immerse them in the world mm. of the story. Um, for those not in the know, can you explain or describe the different uh, places you've kind of occupied and also um, what you mean by a promenade? Sure. Um, so promenade, from the French word to walk, uh, cool. meaning that you, you don't sit down, basically. The audience is on, the, on their feet um, for the duration of the, of the performance and for that reason, uh, we keep the performances fairly short. It's normally between an hour and an hour and a half max. Um, and 
the kind of spaces that we've used. So you mentioned Jekyll and Hyde. That was our that was our first show. That was um, Baltimore House, uh, and we've used Baltimore House a couple of times for different things. Um, we used Ex Cathedral. So that was great. We did Gawain and the Green Knight there. Mm. So you know we're looking for links between the location and the text it, it, in some way. And of course, you know medieval. A great medieval uh, text and an amazing medieval building to form mm. in. So that was awesome. Personally, that was that was a, a great feeling and a, a great experience. Um, where else? Um, well, you know, you've been yeah, to a couple I of our shows yeah, at Via Quartet. So very, very cool. I mean, it's an amazing place. Brilliant um, acoustics. Uh, brilliant I really acoustics. I love uh, the kind of the chorus. Um, it's almost like pagan. Singing in the background of a lot of your shows are really cool. Really, just um, gives it a whole other like spatial feeling because you're walking through, and then what feels like miles away in the cage just comes in the mm, cool. kind of voice comes out. Yeah, it's thanks. Wonderful. I mean, so that was um, Medea and Macbeth mm. that we we did it in the cage um, at the end. And yeah, thanks. I'm glad you. Yeah, oh yeah, it yeah. It's, but, you completely um, sold me on the the idea of how how immersive theatre can can be and can work. Um, yeah, it's I just yeah in your face all the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, just to pick up your question, other places that we performed in uh, St Nicholas Priory, oh, uh, yeah. which is. Um, Possibly the oldest building in Exeter. Mm. We did uh, Faustus there. That was a good, that was a good show. Um, so we did Frankenstein at uh, Great Fulford Estate, which is oh, a, yeah. another stately home. Uh, Is that at, dilapidated as well. It's not in not it's not in a state of disrepair mm. as such. Uh, it's slightly decrepit or around the edges perhaps, mm. but it's a wonderful, amazing place. Uh, like incredible, great hall. Uh, incredible, like Tudor wood panelling um, there, and yeah, uh, awesome, awesome house. Um, we've done um, Cleve Abbey in Somerset. Mm. We did Madea there, um, and then a couple of like perhaps less historic venues. We did um, Jason Yard Mulch at Royal College in Exeter, in Exeter, rather. That was because we were commissioned by a festival. Oh yeah. Um, and we thought, like politically, it was um, an interesting and hopefully positive move to make that site. But that site had basically been mm. dormant and unused for um, five years since the since the college closed. So, from our point of view, mm. we, were, we were trying to kind of get it kickstart a little bit. Of, um, yeah, activity about yeah. regenerating the site. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we used the Tropicana at Western Supermare, which is much more of a, just a, a blank space, mm. a huge space, like incredible potential there. Um, but that in itself, perhaps, architecturally, doesn't have the same kind of uh, inherent uh, level of interest. Take a good look in their eyes. You mentioned using multimedia. Yes. How how is that manifested in your shows? Um, so that's something that has definitely kind of changed and evolved over time. Um, to start with, it was very much the case that you know most of it is done live with actors. Here were a couple of scenes that are done mm. as film uh, and. We kind of we did them as silent films, kind of emulating that that style, and I think that that worked for the kind of the gothic horror mm. nature of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, Sarah and I are both really interested in cinema, and yeah. uh, and and kind of you know we really like to be kind of filmmakers, so we just kind of. Gave ourselves that opportunity to make some films to fit into the show, but it's definitely been a side that has kind of really taken off and and, and grown massively. 
Um, I suppose Spanish just was an interesting one because for that one we included films that we'd made with students from the Central Devon Academy, which is uh, basically students who have been excluded from mainstream education uh, for being autistic. Mm. Um, <laughs> and um, that was a really positive project. That yeah, was yeah. Really great, and they kind of uh, helped us to create. I don't know if you know the story. No, I don't actually. So he basically um, he he makes a deal with the devil, so sells his soul to the devil in uh, exchange for a certain number of years worth of, of power. Mm -hmm. And the play itself is basically like the first bit is him kind of making the deal, and then the end bit is the devil coming back to claim his soul. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole bit in the middle which um, is kind of you know in Marlowe's play. It's it's to do with um, Charles V and the, the the Holy Roman Emperor basically mm. and the Pope, so it's kind of him uh, confronting or um, interacting with the he head of secular authority and the head of religious authority in that day and age, which perhaps not quite so relevant today or, or can be a little. I imagine bit. it being hard for excluded autistic people to grasp. Yeah, well, I, so we basically took that middle bit, and that's we, and we kind of condensed that, and just basically opened it up to them, saying, like, you know, in terms of authority, yeah, like, okay. how do you, if you had infinite power, how would you respond? I see. To, uh, so you kind of used it as a scaffold. Yes. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. That's cool. So, and in terms of engaging those that particular audience, yes. Um, do you think you changed? Their perception of the theatre, uh, in terms of the students themselves, yeah. or yeah, and then perhaps the the kind of their wider um, community. Um, I mean, you'd like to think so. It was, it was a fairly small group that we were working with. I mean, it was five of them. Mm. Um, but I mean, yeah, we went. You know, it's one of those uh, very kind of magical, um, rewarding moments. We went back to the Central Devon Academy. Uh, two years later to run the project again and we saw a bunch of artwork on the wall and one of the students that we'd um, worked with before she kind of used like photos and images from the project as like it was kind of a key part of her her final artwork uh, which was great and she went back into mainstream education um, and I mean she was uh, she was a great kid really and she was mm -hmm. awesome um, and so that that was great. It definitely, I think it was it was really special having the kids attend the performance and seeing themselves in the film within the context of this kind yeah. of professional show. Um, so yeah, I think it was definitely transformative, and and that's you know in in a wider sense that is kind of mission statement for kind of four stories to come and myself as an artist. Which and you mentioned the, like the pagan thing, like mm. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit pagan, and <laughs> the, the kind of the shamanic, uh, hermetic concept mm. of transforming consciousness, like I've, that is to me what it's all about. Yeah. It is transforming the consciousness of your um, your attendees. Your audience There's um, something which has come up in my thoughts about hermetic practice recently. Is there is a lot of ritual in, yeah. in building up to a point of almost trance flow, whatever you want to call it, mm. where you're completely in that realm. Yes. And it's just trying to get to that place and maintain it, um, which is really difficult. <laughs> sure, How yeah. How do you, because you, from the beginning when people are, for example, when I'm standing outside the cave, mm. the bit cave, how do you structure, how do you draw the audience in yeah, well, the one thing that um, whenever I've seen immersive theatre pieces or um, Tom Nard style pieces from other companies, the one thing that always, um, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, sure. <laughs> the one that always pisses me off is the, uh, is, is when you're kind of, you're greeted by somebody just dressed in plain clothes or whatever, mm -hmm. the stage manager, and they're like, right, guys, you know, you're going to be taken in in a minute, and... Uh, 
See, I don't need problems. It's the same way every time I see me. <laughs> and like for me, that is just the worst way to yeah. start a show. Um, so we try and any kind of like behind the scenes stuff that has to happen, we try and and kind of make it as aesthetically uh, in sync with everything yeah. else as possible. Uh, and you know, partially out of necessity, partially out of the fact we can't really afford to hire a, a massive, uh, <laughs> wider team. Yeah. But basically, the actors um, pitch in and, and do pretty much everything. So the, the actors are the guides as well. But it's always it's built into the story, right? Mm. So they, they um, so normally what would happen is that a character or maybe a couple of characters will come and collect the audience, but they'll do it in. They'll be in costume, yeah. they'll be in character, and as soon as you're kind of taken down, that's kind of where the show starts. And I think, um, like you're talking about the, the level of ritual, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. Me. Traditionally, in terms of like vision questing and that sort of thing, the, the shamanic practices, like a really key part of that is mm -hmm. music mm -hmm. and rhythm, and um, it's something that we've been kind of experimenting with. Uh, we did uh, Jason the Outmarch, who's kind of had a, a Pico drumming score. Uh, and we did, oh man, we'll check. We'll check all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, hopefully we'll bring it back at some point. Uh, and um, like Macbeth had a lot of drumming mm. in it. Uh, the kind of that that rhythm, there is something uh, mm. clinical and medical that it that it does to you, yeah. right? In terms of your your consciousness uh, and your level of thinking. And another thing which I think is uh, you know, I've been to other shows where between the scenes there's either a long journey or there's just a feeling of of just any tension like dissipating. Hmm. Uh, and I think music again is like is a cue to the audience, like we're moving yeah. now. But it's also it doesn't it basically kind of um, prevents the audience from like talking to each yeah. other really. And and it hopefully maintains yeah. That yeah. spell or maintains that kind of uh, the yeah, story. Um, there's I recently there was a, a talk as part of our immersive thing mm. workshops about like defining immersion. Where does it come from? Sure. And I thought it was a relatively neat thing, but yeah. it is not. It has been <laughs> going on for thousands of years. Okay. Like, yeah. There's evidence of um, like cave paintings which have like have some kind of relief on them. So then mm. when you have um, like firelit sticks which are kind of moved. The cave paintings are creative. Oh, amazing! Shift, and then they found um, musical instruments in caves. Yeah, which they think were as part of a multimedia experience mm. uh, in telling those stories. So yeah, they had a, one of those um, wind uh, wooden chimes which you'd have on the end of a string and blow oh, yeah, around. Like and a and or and a thing. Yeah, like a full aura thing. Yeah, yeah. So. And I think that just the fact that people were, were doing that thousands of years ago, and we're we're now kind of adding like another dimension to all this stuff. Or not dimension, we're compounding. We're doing more to go back to this this state of uh, immersion, which we we appear to have been fascinated by even as and it's <laughs> yeah, Neanderthals. Neanderthals, so yeah. Sure. Um, it is absolutely so cool. It is really um, cool, yeah. And uh, like the whole idea of like churches and like, cathedrals, and they had. Um, yeah, definitely. It's multi sensory, yeah, the incense. Yeah, it's all so Yeah, exactly. Um, it's absolutely insane. <laughs> Build up to an immersive experience uh -huh. um, is something which, in the symposium, mm -hmm. so I went to for the audience, I went to an immersive um, bees audience. It's called Marking the Space. It's like a run by bath style. It's yeah. a, a kind of discussion space around immersive and audience. Um, one thing which uh, came out of it. 
which I thought was really important is, is the build up to that immersive um, point mm. can start before the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like that kind of, and I think this is particularly um, rings true for theatre. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily for like films or games or um, headset theatres because they're, I don't know, I don't think it will work as well. You've got kind of the hype build from trailers for games and films, sort of thing, and it's difficult to do the same with headset stuff because you just kind of stick it on and you're there. Um, but for theatre, I mean, is that it's the idea that you're doing that in your own home? Or that you go to. Uh, um, well, I can get to that. Okay. Um, the so one of the things which I want to kind of propose to you is that um, there's like a whole industry now of like the, the marketing, the build up to all of it, the piece of immersive theatre happens like way before mm. um, before the actual immersive experience to kind of get people in the room. So when they arrive, they're already like halfway in the immersive um, space uh -huh. before, just so you can like get them into that um, headspace beforehand. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I um, went to, when I, I've been in Shanghai and um, Punch Junk, the poster boys for. Um, yes, uh, I was going to ask you about these guys. Because they're um, in London, they do. The kind of the massive I mean, they're just stuff. They're everywhere these days, yeah. yeah, completely international. They've got um, Sleep No More, which is their kind of loosely Macbeth inspired show, is running concurrently in Shanghai, New York. Wow. Um, and they do stuff in London. Mm -hmm. they, they, there's an extra connection there. I think maybe they met at Exeter University. Yeah. Um, I think actually their first show was at Hogsmeade House. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, so there's a, there's a heritage there, a tradition. Um, yeah, I, I'd never, I'd heard. Lot, read lots uh, lots about them, but I'd never actually seen the show until um, a couple of months ago when I was mm. in, in China. Um, they had this kind of tunnel that they call the decompression tunnel that you kind of you go through, and you basically it's completely uh, pitch black. There might be a few lights at your feet, but basically you can't see anything, and you have to um, to navigate by keeping your hand on the wall, mm. and 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 it kind of goes it. it, it, it Reads and wines, and uh, you know, I was there with some friends. I had no idea like how far ahead mm. my uh, my friend was. Like, and then you suddenly kind of appear into the into the bar, which is all kind of decked out mm. in because uh, it's set in like nineteen twenties. Um, nice. So it's all you know decked out as a nineteen twenties style kind of uh, cocktail bar. So you have kind of you have the decompression, then you have that you know the, the holding area itself is um, set out as in in in, in uh, sympathy with the with the show. Mm. Um, and the drinks probably do help in yes. terms of uh, <laughs> breaking down your barriers yeah. uh, and your inhibitions, um, and then. The show itself starts through like an elevator, so you're all close. you're called in groups, and then you're taken into the elevator, and then they basically just. Uh, other than that, I haven't even mentioned the mask thing. Ooh, there's masks. Yeah, so the audience is masked, and like the that. audience is basically told that they can't talk to each other, um, and they must take their masks off. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I guess there's that kind of uh, masquerade ball yeah. idea that you're basically being liberated to be your secret self or your, you know, your. You can be a bit more perverse or yeah, you know, virus or yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so then that's kind of what theatre is a lot, and especially film as well. Where you, yeah, you can just um, let the audience stare at a scene without feeling like they have to. Get involved, or yes, or without feeling awkward, stuff. like yeah, they're not yeah. allowed to be watching this. Thing. Yeah. yeah, so this is, absolutely. I mean, that, I mean, I think there's something incredibly voyeuristic about cinema, especially like mm. the way you can really kind of linger on somebody's grief or yeah. desolation or the kind of emotions that you know, if you're actually there uh, dealing with somebody in that state, then you're not going to just like sit and watch. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um, 
and then yeah, so this will finish the um, the entrance to the show. Basically, on five floors, they take you through an elevator, and they basically kind of just chuck you off randomly two at a time. So you get effectively completely split up from whoever you have gone there with. Um, and uh, and there's no kind of there's no linear narrative. Oh, I see. You yeah. explore it. Uh, there is like for the performers, there's a there's a line which I think they they repeat three times over the course of three hours. Um, but you're going to see you're seeing these events in, in whatever kind of mm. order. You don't necessarily kind of you're not really clued into what's going on. Um, helps a little bit that yeah, I know Macbeth very well, so mm. I could kind of figure out a few signposts, um, but other things like, you, you know, there is, it's clearly not just an adaptation of Macbeth, they brought in influences from all over the place, mm. um, and so, you know, half the characters, I have no idea really who they were, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but not that that necessarily matters, um, but also they're clearly building a product that, that has re- not exactly rewatchability because it's going to be completely different the second time you watch yeah. it, but um, or the second time you experience it. But they're they're building something that you know, if you go back to it two, three, four, five, ten times, you're going to have a completely different mm. experience every time. Yeah, that's um, something that's happening a lot in games as well. You think, okay. Yeah. Where you can play something and it's got repeatability or replay replay replayability. Yeah, um, absolutely, and they get and, and um, is it the new Spider-Man film um, game, which has like an inc just incredibly well-realized yeah. city that you can yeah. just go wherever you want, do yeah. whatever you like. And, yeah. So yeah, tell me about like these uh, yeah. these VR headsets. Yeah, is so it something that you buy. And... That was it. Yeah. Um, my, I was going to say that the this decompression chamber, which Kent said to you, mm. um, the right idea, I think, you, especially with headsets, because you whack them on, and you're, it's just there. It's very difficult to get that slow, natural rise into immersion. Mm -hmm. Because it's still rather new, and we we need to be sensitive toward audiences who still don't know a lot about it, and need to be reassured. Yeah. Um, and making sure the the, in the the audience is sensitively introduced to your immersive world. Yeah. And then, particularly afterwards as well, you have a offboarding time where right. you can. Gradually release from that state as well, and uh, and have almost like a debrief and mm. um, have, have just you yeah. have discussion as well because you're in a circle. You can take off your headset and look at other people. Yeah, well, I, I guess it is kind of a kind of hypnosis, right? Yeah, and um, like from a magical perspective, you always need that time afterwards to reground yourself to reconnect with the with <laughs> not necessarily the real world, the concrete world. Um, so that makes to, that makes total sense. I mean, I'd yeah, I'd be interested in whether it would be possible to kind of have, you know ritualize or um, magically augment the VR donning experience. Mm. Whether it, cause like breath, like from the magical tradition, breath is so important, like in terms mm. of kind of uh, getting into the right um, mental yeah, yeah. yeah state. Uh, place whether there's any kind of way that you could have like a ritual, a ritual breathing, or regionally, I think that could work because you're in your this this shared space in your in your in your headset, you could have a visual kind of circle, kind of mm. and that's this visually you uh, and, and you could have somebody say now oh, that's what you breathe into the circle, yeah, and then you could slow that circle down, and then you could almost um slightly make get everyone to start yeah in that same, that'd be cool man um, same rhythm that'd be really cool and then you could use uh like the bionic audio stuff 
ambient sound, or actually in the room, in this in this uh, VR theatre space that they had in one of the shine days and things, mm. just to use the kind of lessons learned from like meditation and, and the hypnosis to get people into a open mind state where where the, the kind of the ramp to immersion can is is more slippery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, I um, I'm interested particularly in in that self because using using VR experiences in hospitals, it's, it's very difficult to get people in the zone because mm. I'm not sh- I haven't um, asked the, the people who've got the headsets at the moment how how it's gone. That's one mm. of my tasks. But I want to see how easy it is for people. To just wrap on a headset while they're in a hospital bed mm. and see whether they need to go to a separate space or how how can we distract them from kind of the awful atmosphere of a hospital yeah. to help them get better using um, the most experiences. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really interesting developing. Thinking, uh, yeah, developing yeah. world at the moment. Really. Presumably, you're um, in what you're aware of the welcome stuff and the welcome center. Uh, no, the welcome trust is um, yeah, they've, they've got like a massive building and um, exhibition space in London, but they're basically dedicated to. Well, probably do lots of other things as well, but a, a large part of their mandate is using art to broadcast scientific mm. um, you know, findings, yeah. like what to to, um, to educate about scientific ideas uh, and like a, bit, a large medical focus as well. Um, so, and and the Wellcome Trust is just an um, open. Uh, Welcome Center at the Oxford University. Okay. Um, so that sounds very interesting. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Um, so they might be. Yeah, they might be worth contacting just to worth see. Researching. Yeah. Mm. Just to check. Yeah. No, I see. <laughs> About uh, 360 cameras. Yeah, I was just saying. asking about your kit and yeah. uh, things. So I, I mostly use a U360 um, testing. I think I've been hanging a pretty good to do auto stitching and all that jazz. And there's lots of other cameras which are coming out soon, like the Insta One X, I think I've been getting, which does 5.7K uh, auto stitching, which is really good because they need a whole massive computer to do all the stitching for you. Um, and then there's also the Booz X or something, it's a kind of similar name. Mm. It does 360, again, 5.7K auto stitching, which that means also that you're able to flip out and do 180 3D, um, which I think might be a better shout for point of view filmmaking mm-hmm. uh, or cinematic VR, CGI filmmaking, um, because. There's there's a lot of kind of talk about 360 video being like the ultimate thing and uh, a way of getting getting people to kind of get into somebody else's shoes or see something yeah. close up like this and be affected, be changed mm. in some way. Um, so in terms of like the, what you need to um, experience that film that you've made. Mm. Uh, do you need like super high tech headset? Can you just put your phone no. in a cardboard thing um, and just use that? So or? you can just use. It depends what kind of level of immersion you want. Yeah. If you want them to be in a completely black box, then yeah, you you can load it onto a, a headset um, using the Within app, I think, or you can side load it, um, which I haven't figured out how to do yet, right. uh, on from a computer onto a headset. 
there's, there's yet to be like a good enough like hosting service for your, like, your own content on mm -hmm. Headsets. Um, and I, I'm looking into seeing how technical it's going to be to like have my own like, wrapper around a headset so I can easily add and change different things in the cloud and things. But aside from that, you can also use use a cardboard or straight up just um, put it on YouTube and uh, the YouTube magic will just sort out for you and you can just look around at different Oh, right. okay. uh, which is pretty neat. Really um, okay. There are like other hosting services which are dedicated to VR, like VER.tv. Uh -huh. um, but I found that their technology is a little bit janky uh, when it comes to trying to host their stuff. Because um, they, they've got like an online browser based build your own experiences so you can upload multiple spheres of gaming mm -hmm. and then almost like Google Street View you can move from one to the other. Um, okay. but I mean, I'm, I, certainly um, a friend and colleague of mine and I talked about probably about a year ago now was because uh, he's um, an ex teacher like myself mm -hmm. um, and you know a lot of our work uh, besides the public shows, uh, comes from educational projects. It's basically using 360 cameras in uh, teaching of literature, like creating, um, whether it's like a room or a whole environment that is basically the environment of a story. Mm. So yeah, again, I guess a bit like the Punch Drunk show, you, you've got that, you can experience it how you want, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one of the cool things which I like thinking about 360 cameras is that the audience becomes the editor or the mm. the the camera and your the participant is can decide the not necessarily the narrative but the kind of structure of how they interpret the narrative. Mm. Um which I think is really interesting and I think in, in, in an educational sense, that mm. could work really well because you can just put the the content in just like a, like a spacesuit kind of put the content over a, a over a pair of eyes. Yeah, and then you can curate the the the, the, the consumption of the material. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or it, Absolutely, curate their consumption of it, but also kind of empower them mm. to choose how they yeah. consume it and empower them to kind of, yeah, they, they basically have no choice but to be invested in it on some yes. level. Like they've got to make a choice of where they want to look yeah. and where they want to go and, and what part of the story they're going to follow. Yeah. What about kind of tactical stuff? What about moving things, touching things? Um, Difficult in using cinematic VR 360 stuff because it's it is just a screen wrapped around you. Um, so, are you thinking about like augmented reality? I don't know, maybe. I, I was just just curious. Like a big part of the punch drunk show was being able to sit down somewhere and like look through mm. papers on desks or open drawers and look at things and kind of um, yeah, I think it's just an idle thought really. And that um that story that I mentioned to you before we started recording about using uh, VR in the treatment of all the rehabilitation stroke patients, mm. they it was seemed to be um, kind of providing them with a platform for practical manual tasks uh, yeah. over and over again, kind of uh, and being able to kind of vary the levels of difficulty. Um, I definitely think there's room for. Um, I'm sure people are working on it. Yeah. Um, there's the technology to uh, put a camera on top of a headset to read what your hands look like and then translate that into your experience. So you've got a big uh, oh, yeah. a virtual representation of so your hands. It's not even hands. that you need to wear gloves or yeah, anything. It's done all through um, kind of machine learning of what hands look like, um, mm. which is. Fascinating, and uh, I can't wait to see how that is used um, because you could then, you could literally, um, you could do all sorts of cool things with being in a space and having actual physical objects, but at the same time using the headset to paint 
over one of the right mm. um, Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a cool, cool track. Yeah. How do you think immersive technology, technology these days could affect or change the way you're doing stuff with Boris Um Well, I mean, it's been great to kind of have this conversation, Harry, and to open, open this up. It's something that I've kind of been idly interested mm -hmm. in without really knowing anything about. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the short answer is I don't know. Oh. But uh, the, um, the long answer is, um, yeah, maybe in in all kinds of ways. I mean, I'd just be really interested to kind of um, find out more, especially like on the educational angle. Um, and we've done as, as well as the, the shows that we do. We we run the Young People's Film School here at the Phoenix. Um, so we have been doing a lot of filmmaking, um, and you know, always kind of in terms of like opening up. Heritage texts. I suppose mm. that's another part of the Forest Sword and I, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that it's always been kind of based in some way on a classic literary text and, and it's all about trying to make these things accessible, breathe new life into them, or allow the audience to breathe new life into them. Um, and that's a, always been extremely exciting to me. Um, I did go and see a, uh, a, a theatre show, well, it's called a theatre show, it was called Seance, and it was run out of basically a, fish, a shipping container, um, mm -hmm. but they had, so incredibly mobile, you know, they, they just take the shipping container wherever the show goes, they find, you know, they, I saw it at Glastonbury, and they just found a bit of grass and filmed mm -hmm. the shipping container there, and it was, um, yeah, I... It was an interesting concept. Basically, you went into the show, it's completely pitch black, yeah. and you had these headphones, which are, you know, what's it called? By, oh, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I came out of it thinking, it was, the show lasted, the show, the experience lasted 20 minutes, I think. Um, at maybe the 18th or 19th minute, I'm like, okay, this is finally getting interesting. Okay. And then it was over. Um, I feel like it was a massive. Wait, no, you know, obviously, I feel like judge, like it's a, mm -hmm. it, it, obviously quite an experimental uh, thing to do. And I think they've got a new show, the same company has got a new show, um, which I'm sure will be, you know, have developed the idea yeah. further. But, um, but for me, it felt like that's, you know, it was really ex exciting because I can see the scope of that yeah. technology. Yeah. But then, I was saying, now's the time to. Um, experiment with it. Mm. Make but what, what they, yeah, sure. But what they didn't do any of really was the melding of oh, reality see. with okay, the recording. Okay. Uh, and I think that's perhaps where, um, you know, given our immersive theatre stuff, that mm. that's that's interesting. That's exciting. Like you want to basically put somebody in the position that they can't discern what's yeah. real and what isn't. Um, really, kind of. And again, you know what we were talking about earlier in terms of collapsing boundaries. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, um, there's an artist who I recently experienced, and he's one of the fellows as well. It's called Duncan Speakman, and he's done. He does audio journeys. Yeah. Um, which uh, use sounds um, from the the world around you as you're walking through a uh, like a city. Mm -hmm. um, you go and pick up this this headphones and like this little satchel of kit, and it, it, it uses the sounds surrounding you and a pre-recorded kind of spoken track with kind of soundtrack as well. Yeah. To, to kind of build an experience uh, with with the sounds which are around you as well. Just thinking, it would be cool to have something like that in a, in one of your shows mm. because you could stick headphones on everyone. They'll be isolated then from everyone else, kind of like yeah. the mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you could have like a pre recorded soundtrack as well, but then using the kind of acoustics you get in a place like this or those and the places you go to, to 
do these things, you can get some cool feedback stuff going on to kind of get people into that. It's really uh, kind of negative. Yeah. Vulnerable hates uh, sense, uh, sense of place, sense of mind, uh, state of mind. And yeah, you could you could do some cool stuff with that kind of like immersive technology at the moment. Um, so I was thinking on the way it would be diff it would be difficult to integrate 360 video, I think, into the, the kind of stuff you do because there's still a like a, a veil. Like there's still um, when yeah. you're watching 360 video, there's still a screen, and it's, it's the technology. I think is still quite in its infancy in, in, in that closeness that which you desire. I think in 360 video is still not as um, I, 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 good as actual yeah. theatre. <laughs> well, I hope. So. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, I hope it will never be. Uh, mm. Well, the same anyway. But um, but I don't know. I, I like. I like the kind of um, sharply people's perception. Mm -hmm. Like I like the idea of somebody wearing a, a headset and having kind of experienced some part of the show, whether that's an introduction to the, you know, you could obviously what that could give you that you couldn't get in a space is, I guess, like effects, magical yeah. apparitions and things that's that feel like you're appearing in the same space as you. But almost like if you see somebody coming up, coming up to you, and then basically taking your headset off oh, at the yeah. same time as, a, as an actor yeah. in costume looking exactly the same as that. Yeah. And then basically what you're playing with me. Like so, something like that would be, cool. would, would be really cool. Yeah. So like a simultaneous augmented reality experience. So you're wearing a headset with like a camera on it so it can see and it detects the stuff that's going on. And then, yeah, it could be really cool to figure out how you can like meld those technologies to make some kind of shared theatre promenade experience with with the art section like or, or, or with or like a, yeah. a yeah a, a, a VR first half and live second half or something yeah um, very interesting yeah that'd be really 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 cool. Get watch the space. Yeah, let's do it, Harry. Let's sort it out. Because I, I, like I say, I'm a relative newbie to this kind of technology. Mm. I only know, like, that it exists and that there's people over here who do it a lot better than me. Mm. Um, but I'm keen to, like, start people and go, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we combine this to make this? Mm. Um, and it's definitely possible these days with the amount of investment and also learning and knowledge which has been gained um, and gathered over, over the last couple of years and the past couple of months mm. um, is definitely the technology available to, to do something like that for sure yeah um, like did you see the tempest by the royal the royal I did yes yeah. I was very lucky because that I mean, I, I saw the live link up. I didn't see it. Oh. I wasn't actually there. Did you kind the of theater, you get the kind I, of... I saw the live stream on through the TikTok. I think. Did you, did you yeah. Got the, the Again, I thought that that was like a bit of a missed opportunity. Oh, really? I, I, I mean, the technology was looked amazing. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, it was you know it was great. It was yeah. great. Uh, don't get me wrong, it was really interesting, um, and it's great to see people like the the Royal Shakespeare Company pushing the envelope. Yeah. Um, and there is something really interesting. I like that. I you know the kind of whether it's um, Andy Serkis in his gimp suit or <laughs> yeah. whatever, like seeing the actor acting and having. Yes, it's like, it's like it's like when you get like an exposed view yes. of a shadow performance yeah. or something like that. There is something really interesting about it's that. It's like um, an authenticity there. Yeah. Um, one thing actually, which uh, coming off from that and thinking about how audiences get more involved before a performance, 
is that um, they really kind of what you want to do is they really enjoy like behind the scenes stuff, mm. um, and in like the build up to a performance, they enjoy having a kind of porous connection with the theatre company and seeing a little bit of like how things work <coughs> yeah. up to something, and then having having over the characters. Yes, I'm not sure how I this. feel about that personally. Yeah, I mean when I because all all of these live uh, theatre link ups and stuff, and obviously the the opera or the Shakespeare, they often have a, a little kind of behind the scenes yeah. thing. So I'm I'm just like no, I don't want to <laughs> see any of this. I just want to be going to this cold. Oh, okay. I don't want any kind of. I don't want any suggestion. I don't want to see. It's like when you, when you know, obviously DVDs are a thing of the past year these days. But it's like when you used to have a DVD uh, with yes. an animated menu, which shows you like a yes. cool thing from the film. It's like, no, I want to see want that in ruined. context yeah. of how it's designed to be shown to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the behind the scenes stuff for me is fascinating, but I will only ever want to see that after yeah. I've seen. I think I'm in the same boat actually. Uh, well, I don't know, because I do like, there's like a weird addiction, like a fetish to, to yeah. wanting to, to see and find out as much information about something like a film or a game before actually playing it. Okay. Um, and that there's a lot, there's a whole marketing culture around that at the moment, I think. I've, I've bought in it, I think. Uh, but there is, there's also a kind of, you have to be that, you have to find that delicate balance between actually not spoiling the actual experience. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. I know, I, I went through a, a period of my life where I just refused to watch trailers for films that I had already decided mm. that I was going to see. Like, oh, how well did I get? Yeah, it was all right. I think that what what um, what um really did me over was Iron Man. Because, uh, mm. like, I, I love Iron Man, the first yeah. one. Uh, but the trailer is essentially just the whole story of Iron Man. Yeah. All the best bits. Yeah. Uh, smushed together so I did get you know I watched it thinking well I mean it's great but I feel like I've seen this yeah. whole film that's what trailers do these days um this is the actual trailer three or something yes yeah mm-hmm. it's kind of three down the hide. <laughs> um but yeah how are we doing for time Harry I might have to yeah um, well, I think we've gone on a bit um I yeah we're four minutes over the time I said I'd leave the cinema <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's so, yeah, conversation. probably a good time to end. There's people in the projector yeah, yeah. behind us, I feel yeah. like. They might need well, to thank you very much for talking to us. You're welcome, Harry. Really, it's really been good. an absolute pleasure. And um, uh, let's let's talk again sometime. Please, um, let's, let's do that. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah. keen to continue the conversation about how technology can improve your poor swordsness. Yeah, well, absolutely. Let's not. Not, not that just, it needs improvement. <laughs> well, but let's not just have a conversation. That's just fucking good. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, yeah, that was another thing which came up in the uh, in the kind of chat thing about uh, the immersive symposium, which was, I uh, wrote it down. Fucking do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for listening to Chapter 2 of the Immersive Talk podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Wilmot. We're partly funded at the moment by the Southwest Creative Technology Network. And I hope to do many more of these podcasts in the future and improve the quality over time. The little music sound bites you heard was from a song called TikTok by Glad Rags, and I found that on cchound.com.